Good evening. I'm so glad that you decided to join me tonight. I'm Sandy McDaniel, just so you're in the right room. And um, I'm here to share something, because I have something you don't have. It's experience. I have raised my own children, I have worked with my grandchildren, and I have taught parenting for 56 years now. So I have been around the block a few times. And so one is wisdom, you know, somebody my age hopefully has some wisdom, but also a ton of experience in working with parents. And so what I've done tonight is collect some of the things that I think will be useful for you, and then we'll have a period where you can ask questions so that we get in exactly what you want to know. This is the most difficult time there has ever been to be a parent. Now we tell every generation that, but it's true. Right now, I think the biggest problem that we have has to do with the media. The addictive, the, the brain dead, big brain killing, the media that is obsessing not only our, our adults, but also our children. But there's another part of, of what's going on that we might not think about. You might need to be older to, to see it. Children go, don't go out and play anymore. They don't just go out and run out and play. When my kids were little, they came home, they had a snack, and then they disappeared into the neighborhood. We didn't know where they were. We didn't need to know where they were. And they would, well, some of them would magically come home around dinner time, and the others we had to send, you know, one in particular, my son, we had to send somebody for him all the time. But the point is, is that when children went out and played, they were creative about what they did. It was magical because they had the wind blowing through their hair because they didn't have to have helmets when they rode bicycles. You know, they, they could go out and dig a hole, they could set a field on fire, they could do imaginative and creative and all the things that kids do. But now what's happened is we've turned parents into herders, H-E-R-D-E-R-S. They have to take everybody and go somewhere. And they have to take everybody and go somewhere. So it's changed the lingo of the parent. This is what the parent sounds like. Would you guys hurry up? What do you mean you can't find your cleats? Would you stop fighting? If you do that again, you turn into this wound up, overwound up toy that's always trying to get the herd somewhere. And then the herd has to all go. I mean, everybody has to go to Betsy's ballet. <sighs> well, for them, particularly. They're probably on their gadgets while they're there, but they're not out playing. So the fact that children don't go out and play anymore has forever changed the face of parenting. What we want to do is raise reliable, respectful, responsible, resilient, loving human beings. In order to do that, we need to prepare our children for the lives that they are living. We talk a lot about peer pressure to children. I mean, God, I want you out for peer pressure, and you're terrified about peer pressure. The older they get, the more terrified you become about peer pressure. What is it? I teach a class, it's called Making Good Choices class, and it was originally designed for fifth grade, fifth graders going into middle school. But then it kind of got adapted in fourth grade through high school, and so I've taught it in lots of grades. But the, the intent of it was is to train for combat our children that we're sending to middle school. Everybody went, oh, we're sending them to middle school, and they, you know, they won't be safe, and oh, well, we didn't train them. We need to train them. And one of the ways we trained them in the beginning was to have an experience of peer pressure. This comes from James Dobson's book. And it's real life. I mean, this really happened. They had an experiment. And they got a room full of kids. And they said, OK, we're going to take a survey. I want to, you to raise your hand when I point to the longest line. It was really obvious, and all the kids are going, totally cool, something we can do, you know. We're all going to be successful here. 
but they sent one kid out. And when they sent one kid out, they said, when that the boy comes back in, I'm going to say, I want you to raise your hand when I point to the longest line. But when I point to ABC, when I point to C, being the longest line, nobody raise your hand. Are you listening to me? Don't start it up. Nobody. Keep back, glue them to your knees. Nobody raise your hand. Okay, let's get the kid back in. So the kid comes back in. We're taking a survey. Raise your hand when I point to the longest line. The little one, the medium one, the longest one. Nobody raise your hand. In 78% uh, of the time, the kid who went out started the hand up, looked around, and put their hand down. Peer pressure. Interesting enough, they did the same experiment. They sent somebody out. And when they came back in, same instructions, except this time, I want you, let's say she's the one that went out, it's somebody who's behind you, you, you to raise your hand. Only you, the rest of you keep your hands down. Nobody else raise your hand, okay? Just her. All right. Then I do an experiment. Raise your hand when I point to the longest line. The one hand went up. In 82% of the time, the other kid just automatically went up with the one. The point of this is, and the kids, this is what we teach the kids, do you realize then, and I always say to them, so what's the point? That was interesting, so what? And they tell me, you better choose your friends wisely. Because if you have one person who's going to support your morals and values, if you have one person who's going to stand up with you, you are much more likely to do so. And watch out for peer pressure. So the whole class is about um, having them be <laughs> bulletproof to the peer pressures of that age that's coming ahead of them. Um, we want to teach them to be uh, uh, prepared. I co-wrote a program with a lady called, uh, named Peggy Bielan. And in this program, we did some research and we went to kids who were, had made bad choices. And bad choices, I mean bad choices. Jail and drugs and, and getting pregnant and the things, all the things that are on your list of, oh, please don't let my kid do this. Okay, those things. And we said to those kids, what, if, what, what was it you didn't know when you made the choice to put you here? The number one reason was we couldn't think of anything else to do. So we invented a game called The Choice is Yours. And what we basically were doing is training kids to think ahead of time. Because what research showed is that if I have rehearsed something, when it comes up, I have a better chance of going against or standing up to peer pressure because I've rehearsed it. I.e., you walk in a party, you're at somebody's house, and they hand you a beer. You don't want to drink it. This is not the time to moralize. If you start moralizing, oh, and the blah, 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 they go to that place where kids go, you know? That one, okay? They aren't in their bodies. I don't know where they go, because I'm too old, I've forgotten. But they go there, okay? Don't moralize. You don't want to drink the beer. What could you do? So, if you're in a class, if I'm teaching them making good choices class, then the kids will raise their hand and I will write up all the different things they say. You could go and pour it out. You could put it down somewhere. You could put something else in the same color as beer. Apple juice. Same color as beer. Okay. You write them down. Then you do plus and minus. And you go through. Oh, and by the way, somebody, some kid will say, uh, you could just say I don't drink beer. Listen to me. 7% of the kids can do that. 7. And I tell the kids this. I say, so what number, what percentage need something else to do? 93. It would be kind of like Russian roulette to think you're the 7%. Pay attention. Let's learn what else we could do. So, in the, you can pour it out. The plus is you would be tempted to drink it. The minus is somebody could see that you had an empty glass and fill it up. So you go and you do all the one, the whole list, plus and minus. 
And then we ask, when you, have, when you can decide, when you know which of these you would choose if this happened to you, nod your head. Why don't we have them tell us? Because then they tell you what they think you want them to say. And then in the moment of peer pressure, they go, they hesitate because they can't remember, because they, can re they get caught in it. It doesn't matter. All of these are saying no. You don't care which one they do. You just care that they have something that they can do other than to take and drink the beer if they don't want to. I used to come home. Of course, my kids were, you know, like, oink, oink, oink. They were the, the, the test case for everything I ever did. And um, <laughs> truly. And so I would come home and I'd go, okay, you guys are going to play the choice is yours. Never did they go. Yeah! Oh, wow! Oh, good! Thank you! They were always like, no! We've got homework! Oh, no! It stinks! Oh, no! Don't make us do that! And my son, who was the funny one, you know, oh, and I would say, there's a long way and a short way to do this. The long way is I'll give you a great big, long dissertation on why this is important, and then we'll play the game. The short way is, we'll just play the game. My son, who was the funny one, would say, come to think of it, I'm just dying to play. The choice is yours. So we would play it. And what we would do is anything that I was concerned about, I mean, obvious things like drugs. I mean, see, we've got to go back a few years because we weren't dealing with pot and marijuana. And, but you, you would want to deal with those. What would you do if? If they know ahead of time what they would do, they can make a better choice. The choice is yours. When you scream and yell at children, they cannot hear you. Fear cuts off your ability to think and reason. This is why I have a concern that we're measuring children by testing in school. Because there's some children that don't do well with tests. I could be smart as could be about whatever the test is about. I could talk about it. I could give a lecture on it. But if you put it in a test form and to put a time thing on it, I'm in trouble. So fear cuts off your, if you're afraid of a test, you're not going to do as well, which is my point on that. Fear cuts off your ability to think and reason. So here you are in your little space, and in comes unhappy mom who screams, what are you doing? Well, the loud noise right away sets them into fear, never mind angry mom. And then they, and they go to that place again. That one, you know, I don't know where it is. They go, they disappear. So they don't hear what you said when you scream because of the fear cuts off your ability to think and reason. And so if you were to scream and yell at a child and then say, tell me what I just said, it wouldn't be pretty. I don't know. I didn't hear you because I was afraid. Let's talk a little bit about anger. Nobody makes you angry. Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> you're driving down the road, down the freeway in the morning, somebody cuts you off, you're going, hey, good morning, peace and love. You're driving down the road the next morning and somebody cuts you off and you are following them with a verbal machine gun. <laughs> what changed? You did. If you tell children they make you angry, first of all, you're lying, but second of all, you're doing shame and blame. If you get angry about your children, it's because you got upset or they crossed one of your boundaries or you're tired or you're sick and tired of... There's a reason. But it isn't because they made you angry. It's because you chose to be angry. Anger is the second feeling. When I was first told this, you know, I have a temper. Anybody who's passionate has a temper. I have a temper. So, you know, it, it was like a train would come in, grab me, beat the snot out of me, and throw me back on the truck tracks, okay? And it was, anger's the second feeling. I think so. Look at this example. You're out in the front with your toddler, and all of a sudden you hear, screech! 
and you look over and the car didn't hit the toddler, but the toddler's in the street. So you go, the toddler that was not killed by the car, and basically kill the kid, right? <laughs> so you just taking their heads off their shoulders and screaming at them, I told you a thousand times, you know. Well, you sound like you're angry. If there's a feeling first, what would it be? Fear. Fear? Fear? I didn't hear. Tell me, tell me loud enough that I can Relief hear. that they're okay. okay. Relief that they're okay. Frustrated that you've told them a thousand times and they still went on the street. There's a feeling before. Love. Now, how this helps, this will help you, but how it helps with a child is a child comes home and they're stained. And what are you angry about? Tell me. They can't dissect it because they're in the oh, of it. But when they calm down, then you can go to another feeling. If you couldn't say anger, I'm angry, what would you say? Oh, I'm really sad. I'm really I'm something else. And you could even help them with the words to have them pick one. Because then you can dissect down to what's the problem and work on the problem. Anger is an unidentified missile that just comes through and gets you. <laughs> but this is one of the ways I learned to work with anger. Anger that is not dealt with turns to resentment. Resentment that's not dealt with turns... Anger, resentment, revenge turns to revenge. The anger, resentment, revenge cycle is what's going on now in our society. We have so many explosive people. So what you want to do is not start that in your family, particularly with your discipline. If you start the anger, resentment, revenge cycle, then you're going to have problems. If your children resent your discipline and resent how you do it, then this cycle starts, but if it's fair, even though they don't like it, it won't set it off. Stuffed anger is a big problem with children's health, I think, but it's also a problem in that children turn into time bombs. We don't know when it's going to go off, we don't know what's going to set it off. And then any of their friends can set it off at school. You know, what, what was that about? I don't know why I got so angry. Well, it's Stuffed anger. When I work with uh, in the Making Good Choices class, I take this pretty good sized balloon and I'll talk about things that happened all day and I'm blowing up the balloon and the whole front row of kids <laughs> are going like this because <laughs> they know. What I have is I have in my cards, I have a pin because it doesn't look like I have a pin, but I have a pin and at some point, bam, boom. Because that's what happens when you collect anger and don't diffuse it, don't get rid of it. The best way to diffuse anger is to run. You can have the child go out and run back and forth and touch the fence several times, run down the street, <laughs> run away. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just run, 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 run. Run off the piss and vinegar. My favorite way of working with it if, when I had children was big black bag. We held, we hung this black bag, it's hard to say, it's like rubby baby buggy bumper. <laughs> we hung the black bag in the garage. One day I got out of the car and I was really mad about something, so I took off my jacket and I went, I'm like, it's a, I, oh, hurt my wrist, because they're very dense. So I bought a little plastic blue bat, and the only place that bat was used was on the blue bag, the black bag. So, we had a boy who lived with us a lot, and his name was Doug. Doug and Scott would come in, and I'd look at him walking in, and I'd say, Doug, ten hits on the black bag. I'm fine! I said, are you with me again? It's 15. He'd go out there, and of course, the first few hits are stupid woman, right? Stupid woman. <laughs> you know? <laughs> of course. And then he would hit whatever I saw and be beating the snot out of the black bag. Had I left that alone, that little pile of would have ended up probably on Kathleen, but it ended up in our house. So what we did is we taught the kids to go out and use the black bag when they had a head of steam going up. I remember one time Scott said to me, asked me if I could do something, and I said no, and he says, is that a definite no? 
And I said, it's a definite no, and he said, I'll be right back. And he went right out the door. <laughs> and he just was beating the door on the, the black bag, which is fine, because I wasn't going to change my no, and he was frustrated. I get that. That's okay. That's not disrespectful. I'm okay with that. Um, a way that I developed, one of the grandchildren had the problems with explosive anger, and so my therapist friend said, get him to take deep breaths. Well, there wasn't any way in heck that was going to happen. Okay? So I came in one day and I had this perfect picture of a dragon. And I said to him, just free fall with me. Who does this remind you of? He laughed and he said, me. And I said, I was thinking the same thing. Okay, here's the deal. When you start to get that voice, I want you to go in the other room and I want you to you were, listen to me. <laughs> About eight or ten times. And then I want you to be a little dragon. <laughs> you want a kid to do deep breaths and he didn't want to do it, guess what? I won't be a dragon calms the body down so that they can deal with whatever's going on. One of the problems with stuffed anger is it makes children vulnerable to negative influences. I've worked with the gang kids, I've worked with uh, the kids that won't want to be gang kids, with truant kids, difficult kids. And I would say what they had in common was stuffed anger that was coming out in inappropriate places, but they were also vulnerable to other people's negative choices. I want you to learn to separate a child from their behavior. And the best way I can do that is bring a friend of mine in here. Hi, what's the deal? Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I'll, I'll talk to him. I usually use Harmony in a self-esteem program that another lady and I co-created. And when we start the class, all the kids wave and say, Hi, Harmony. So would you do that right now, please? Hi, Hi Harmony. Okay. If I can get a room full of grown-ups to wave at a... <laughs> can you imagine what a bridge a puppet can be for a child? Oh, Harmony's really, he's really unhappy. Oh, God. I wonder what happened to him today. Oh, I don't know. He went to school. Look at it, he's just shaking. Oh, I wonder where he was when something happened. The kid says, playground. <laughs> I said, oh, what happened on the playground? Kid was mean to him. We just found out what your child didn't, couldn't tell you without the puppet. But in this case, Harmony, what's the matter? Oh, you're really angry. Yeah, I can see you're really angry. You, go, you hate Harry? Oh, wow. That's a pretty intense. Okay, calm down, calm down. Take a deep breath. Let it out. Take another one. Okay, now look at me. Why do you hate Harry? Because he bites and he pinches and he steps on my new shoes. Okay, Harmony, back here. If Harry didn't bite, didn't pinch, and didn't step on your new shoes, could you like him then? Yeah, you could like him then. So you don't like what he does. Oh, yeah. This is actually from that program. What I'm trying to do, one is to show you how to use a puppet to work with children. But the other thing is that to separate a child from their behavior means that you focus on the behavior. If you start your sentence with you, Y-O-U, the second word is always going to be are, and that's about their being. You are lazy. You are thoughtless. You are inconsiderate. Instead, you're thoughtless. You would say, you need to be really careful when you swing the bat. Instead of saying, you're mean, you say, it's unacceptable. I like unacceptable, not acceptable, acceptable, unacceptable, instead of good and bad. 
It's not acceptable to hit your sister. It's not kind to hit your sister. I'm using words to tell the child what the problem is instead of labeling the child. Labels just kill children because you can't change your being, but you can change your behavior. And so Harmony's point is to separate a child from his or her behavior. Don't make discipline about pleasing you. I'm so disappointed in you. You made me so mad. That's about you. And here's what happens is when the kids go off to college, they get the dumb view and go off to college. And then they go on a tirade because they don't have to please you anymore. Go back and focus on the behavior. Focus on the problem. And don't make it about you. The shame and blame game is very dangerous for children too because they carry it with them. I'm so disappointed in you. I, um, you know better, shame on you. Those words are, again, they, they, they hit the being of the child. It's like, here's what's happening, is that behavior is not acceptable and here's the consequence. You don't have to label them for it. I mean, how many stupid things have you done this week? <laughs> and somebody walked around and labeled them, you know? I mean, and, and I'm not trying to be rude to you, but all of us, how many stupid things have we done? So we're all trying to learn how to get along, how to survive, and how to meet the demands of parents and their friends' parents and everybody else, and it's a huge job. One of the things you want to watch is how many words you use when you're bad. I do private parent coaching. People come to my house or I call them and we, we work out their issues. And often I've gotten like a, like a, a woman or something and she would just and every time I try to talk and I'll go, to the husband in this case, this scenario, I'll say, does she always talk this much? Oh, yeah. And I said, and you, you want to know why your children don't listen? Children know exactly what they did. They know exactly why you're mad. And it's like, you don't have to go into a huge dissertation around what you're concerned about. Running in the room and swinging a bat and then hitting your sister is not acceptable. Here's the consequence. I told you a thousand times. Or the really crazy one is, how many times do I have to tell you? The answer to that is as many times as I don't hear it. Well, they hear it when the consequence catches their attention. There are a couple of tricks that are really cool. I'm going to teach them to you. One is called instant replay. My daughter Kathleen would come in, and she would be, let's see, it's a word. What's a word that I can use? She was just. She'd come and I'd say, hi, Kathleen, and she'd go, meow. So she'd be walking through the room, and I'd say, stop, please. And she'd do the thing, turn around, please. So she'd turn around and face me. Mom, I'm just tired. I said, I'm tired too, Kathleen. And that lingo, that attitude, what it depends on what she did, is not acceptable. Instant replay. What that meant is she had to go back out the door and come in again. Mm -hmm. She would come in <laughs> and she'd go, hi mom! <laughs> and I'd say, hi Kathleen, how was your day? <laughs> totally shitty mom! <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you want to talk about it? No, I just want to go to my room. I said, okay, have a nice trip down to your room. <laughs> my point was, is there's a line of, you know, I, I grew up in the yes or no, sir, don't talk back, sir. I mean, whoo, did we talk back to, if we even frowned at them, they, there was a big imprint in the wall, like your body, where your body went sailing through. So, you know, I don't want to do that, but there's, there's a place where you need to be respectful. 
You don't talk to me like I'm stupid. It's not acceptable. It's not the preteen teens. They start talking to you like you're stupid. And it's like, mm, I don't think so. One of the problems children have is when somebody, a friend, asks them to do something and they don't want to do it, they don't know what to do with that. So um, if Scott came up to me and he, with a friend after school and he said, Mommy Dearest, started it with Mommy Dearest. Mommy Dearest, John wants to know if I can go home with him after school. He just told me I don't want to. Mommy Dearest was my clue. So if he called me on the phone, and, and he, he, was, he was great. He said, Mommy Dearest, John wants me to spend another night with him. I say, no, you can't. Oh, you can't. oh sure, you can, because I know John can't hear me. Oh, yeah, they can have you. In fact, they can keep you forever. He's going, no, Mom, please, come on, one more night. You know? <laughs> I, he told me he doesn't want to, so at the end I'll say, no, Scott. <laughs> but the Mommy Dearest gave him an ally, and I was his, I was his ally in that case. Children are not trying to drive you crazy. Are you sure? <laughs> well, since you're here tonight, you're probably wondering if that's true. They're asking two questions. Is this how I use power, and do you mean it? From the time a child is born, they realize they have something, but they don't know what it is. I'm talking about power, personal power. They don't know what it is, so like Star Wars, they take the, whoa, what's this thing? And they start checking it out. Is this how I use power? Hit my sister. Is this how I use power? I'm not eating that. Is this how I use power? I'm not getting in my car seat. Is this how I use power? And then, if you're clever enough to have a consequence that catches their attention, they go and do it again. And you go, what? Ah! Well, they're always going to do it again, because they always have two questions, and the second one is, do you mean it? Is this how I use power? Do you mean it? If you mean it, then they're very resourceful. They'll give up. But if you don't mean it, then they're going to run you through a hoop. One of the things I want to tell you about teens, because I was reading this when I was deciding what to do tonight, the pre pre Prefrontal, yeah, prefrontal co cortex. <laughs> Could I pull that one out tonight? No. Prefrontal, pre, what is it again? Prefrontal. <laughs> well, you're gonna remember because I'm just messing it up. What happened? Prefrontal cortex. Yeah. All right. Uh, their brain is not developed, and so that affects their thinking and reasoning. So when you say to a teenager, which, oh, trust me, you will say it so many times, what were you thinking? They weren't. So you have to really keep, it's not so much keep a leash on them as keep talking to them, keep involved in their lives so you're helping them to make good choices and helping them to think about what they're doing. And when they screw up, rather than going psycho on them, just have a consequence that catches their attention. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's, it's very difficult for parents of teens because they've done all this work on the little kids, and then they think that now they're going to make good choices. Well, it goes right into this area of insanity. And then we have them drive. <laughs> and then they take your car. I remember Kathleen, I think, cracked up my station wagon like day two after she got her her driver's license, you know? I mean, it was like, it's just a car. <laughs> she wasn't hurt. No, that's where you have to go, where, you know, you seriously would kill them. <laughs> you had to work with it. It's really important that you have boundaries and con consequences. Boundaries that are clearly defined, boundaries that don't change, boundaries and consequences. I was working with a 14-year-old boy and he came into the, the room. And when he came in the room, he threw himself in the chair, sat down, did a big sigh. When I started talking, he looked at his watch and yawned. Now, I could get really, especially with my background, I could get really mad about that. Instead, I said, you know what, John? We only have 45 minutes together. 
So any time that you choose to show me how unhappy you are with being here, I'm going to start over. Now here's what start over looks like. Hey John, how are you today? I saw you, I saw you came in on your skateboard today and I just would repeat whatever I'd said so far. And he was like, oh God. <laughs> what was really funny was he was so used to this behavior that he would sit there and he would participate and then all of a sudden he'd slip into it like, and he'd he try to, you know, trying to not have me see it so I didn't start over again. But this is a great story, but it's also a great tool. We had did agreements and consequences in our house because what happened was you'd tell a child to do something and then they wouldn't do it or they'd only do part of it and they'd say, you didn't say that or I didn't hear you. So agreements and consequences just take care of the whole thing. Scott was watching TV one day. I came and stood between the television and his view, and he's trying to look around me, and I said, Scott, I want you to wash the car, okay? I want you to take everything that isn't, your, isn't mine out of the car. I want you to vacuum the car, wash the car, and drive the car, and I want you to do it by noon, okay? I okay, Mom, okay. He's looking, I said, tell me what I just said. I heard you. I said, tell me what you just said. There's a long way and a short way to do this. And they all knew I used that thing, so they were like, oh, no, no, no big lecture. Okay, fine. I'm going to vacuum out the car. I'm going to take everything out that doesn't belong to me. I'm going to wash the car. I'm going to dry the car, and I'm going to do it by noon. Correct. Should you not do it by noon, you can't use the car for the whole weekend. Now tell me the whole thing. The whole thing? I said, there's a long way and a short way to do this. I'm going to wash. No, he's getting annoyed with me, but he's going to tell me. I'm going to wash and back in the car. I'm going to take everything out that doesn't belong in there. I'm going to dry the car. And if I'm going to do it by noon, and should I choose not to do it by noon, I'm not going to have the car for the weekend. I said, thank you for listening. Then I just go about my day. I don't got hassling and go on, you know, you better wash the car. Have you seen what time it is? 12 oh, 01. Oh, mom. Oh, jeez. Now you go and wash the car now. He could have the time to do it, the whole space of time, but now he's going to do it now. Go and wash, do it now. While he was doing that, his reality button would unstick. <laughs> Mom, I told John and Paul and David I'd take them to the football game tonight. I said, well, <clears throat> gee, that's going to be hard for you, isn't it, when you call them up and tell them you don't have a car. <laughs> I didn't back down. Could I back down, then none of our agreements meant anything. But if you make them repeat what you said or tell you the whole thing, they don't like it. In fact, they hate it. But then you know that they heard what you want them to do and you, they have the consequence in mind. And that really works so much better than just bugging them all the time. You need to be consistent. When you're consistent, as much as you can possibly be, then you don't have to do things over and over and over again. My uh, granddaughter from California was here. Her name is Haley Kay. And I had Haley Kay and two grandchildren from here, Chelsea and Nick, in the back of my car. They were five, seven, and seven. So they were kind of big for the back seat of my car. So they were pushing and shoving. And they started giggling and shoving and pushing and shoving. And I was driving. And I pulled off the side of the road. And it was kind of perfect because I hit a little bit of gravel. So I just went, shh. <laughs> drama. I didn't say a word. Haley Kay said, what just happened? <laughs> Five-year-old Chelsea said, it's not safe for her to drive while children are fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Haley Kay said, what do we do now? Nick, who was seven, said, we promise we're going to stop and we actually stop. So they promised they stop. They promised they would stop. And I drove the car and never said a word. 
but they all knew that I mean what I say, so they didn't challenge it. That night, there were four of them now, and they were all in my bunk room, and they were giggle, 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 giggle. And I went in and I said, look, I promised your parents that I'd get you down early because we got to get up early because we're doing something fun, okay? So you, you can do blue tomorrow. Just go to sleep. So I just got back to my computer and I heard blue. I said, strike one. Haley K said, what does that mean? <laughs> Nick said, it means that if we don't stop right now, or the next person who talks or giggles is going to sleep in the living room by themselves tonight. <laughs> it's so cool to have taught parenting for so many years because I have so many of these little tidbits. Children hate to be bored, they detest being bored, they can't stand being bored. This book, called Recipes from Parenting, my first parenting book, is based on boredom as a way to discipline and be with children. Whining. Oh, golly. Would you stop whining, please? Come on, please stop whining. I'm listening. Stop whining. Well, you, you, would you stop whining? Whining drives me crazy. Never tell them what drives you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you are giving bullets yeah. to a literally to an empty gun. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> you know what I have the funniest ears? I can't hear when you whine. When you want to talk to me. Leslie, come and, come and talk to me. When you want to talk to me, come and talk to me. Now, I'm not going down the hall slamming doors, but that was my mother's gate. I'm just going across the room. Guaranteed, Leslie is coming with me and going to whine again because her second question is, do you mean it? Do you mean it? What? Do you mean it? Okay, do you mean it? So, I don't need to go, ah, oh, ah, like this when she whined. You know what? I have the funniest ears, and they can hear you when you whine. When you want to talk to me, come and find me. I'm just going in small spaces. Probably the second time, if she's really defiant, the third time, she'll just go, whatever, and tell you. Because it's boring to follow an adult around who <laughs> doesn't get mad doesn't get psycho. Yeah. Fighting. Children will be fighting in the room. And what you do is you run in the room and you go, who started this? <laughs> Are you crazy? Now you have fighting and lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Godzilla comes in and is furious and yells, who started this? Are you going to be Oh yeah, it was me, uh huh? I don't think so. No, it was him, and what are you talking? We're not fighting, you know, I mean, they're gonna lie up a storm. So you go in the room and you just say, you know what? You're breaking the rule in this house. Our kindness rule. I suggest you have the kindness rule in your house. We are kind to each other. It's the only umbrella you need. It fits everything. <laughs> And if we were to raise kind children at home, then we would be sending kind children out into the world, and maybe we'd have a chance at changing the way things are. But in, in this case, you go and you say, you broke the kindness rule. So here's the deal. The oldest military strategy on the planet is divide and conquer. If you have twins or triplets or quadruplets or uh, think about that, they have multiple children, then, you know, they hate to be split up. But even children who aren't twins or triplets or all, they don't like to be split up. So when you split them up, you don't split them up for an hour. You split them up for 15 minutes. Then you say to them, okay, you guys work it out. You figure out how to be together. You can be together. Otherwise, 
next time it's going to be longer. And you might do longer. You might end up with them being apart for a long period of time. But they earned it. See, if you do it in the beginning, you guys are kept me together for three hours, then it's overkill. It starts the anger, resentment, revenge cycle. It's about you, and they don't learn from it. If they earned it in increments, <coughs> excuse me, then they, they are more likely to, to understand. Um, I have two discipline systems. One is called the penalty box and the other is called the minute drill. The penalty box is for age 18 months up to two years old. Now you can use the penalty box up through the teens and there are times when you might use the penalty box for all the different ages, but the minute drill has become so popular with age three and up that when I get to that you'll see why. But this is what the penalty box looks like. It has to do with hockey. That's why we named it that. In hockey, if they break a rule, you go to the penalty box, you go to this place, you have to sit and be quiet, and then you go back and you get in the game. If you break a rule again, you're out in the penalty box again. So it's something that kids hear and understand from the games that they have played, the term anyway. Um, I don't like timeout, but timeout didn't work for me. Because um, as I watched people doing timeout, I saw people gave too many warnings. They, when they sent them to timeout, they were just over the top <coughs> angry because they waited too long. Um, they, they also, um, oh, the, the, the kids would control the family by screaming and yelling. So you'd have a kid in, one kid in timeout, and the whole family's going, you know deaf, being deaf from the, the wailing. So what we did was make the first rule is when you go to the penalty box you have to be quiet for the amount of time you're there, however minute, many minutes you are old. So a two year old's going to sit there for two minutes. For hitting, disrespect, or unkindness, you would go t to the penalty box. The process is you have the penalty box be somewhere where the, when you send them the penalty box, they know where to go. Um, we've had it on stairs, stairwells, stairs. You don't want them to be able to be entertained while they're there. So if the stairs show into a room where everybody's doing stuff, you don't want to do that. But the stairwells around the corner, that's great. Um, put a little chair in where the washing machine and dryer are, and cat litter are. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they go in there, but you don't close the door. It isn't about banishing, it isn't about that kind of thing. It's about taking a moment to understand that that behavior is not acceptable. Now the hard part to train is to get them to be quiet while they're there. And you, you talk to them, I'm going to use you again since I used you before. Here's the process. Hitting your sister is not okay. Did you notice I touched my chin? That's because you look, makes you look at my mouth and my eyes. Hitting your sister is not acceptable, all right? You need to sit here for two minutes. You can't talk, you can't scream, you can't get out. Timer. If you talk, scream, or get out, your time starts over. So you could be out of here, ding, you're out of here. Or you talk, oh, starts over. You talk, you scream, you get out, oh, oh, oh. Two minutes, it's a short time. You can do this. Now see, I become a cheerleader as opposed to, you better sit there and if you don't sit there, I'm gonna tear your left eye bell out of your head. You know, I mean, the stuff we do, okay? It becomes a whole different energy. And so, do you mean it? It's on the child's mind, so of course they're gonna do something. You go, oh, look! You, dang, you, you almost got it. Okay, let's start over. You can do it. Once they show you they can do it, once you know they can do it, because they've shown you, the gig's up, okay? <laughs> they want you to think they're too little or they can't, or they're too wiggly or they can't. <laughs> We've been doing this for I don't even know how many years. 15, 20 years. So I know they can do it. 
I know the worst of the worst can do it. The most difficult can do it. You just have to stay in the game in the training. And then, uh, then pretty much it's, it's over. They sit quietly, the time starts over. If once they know what the penalty box is, you say, go to the penalty box, and they say, not gonna go, no. And you say, listen to me, if you walk to the penalty box and you go yourself, it's two minutes. If I need to take you, and I will, <laughs> then it's doubled. Four minutes is this much time, two minutes is this much time. It's up to you. Full training, all the details, is on Don't Feed the Dragon, my parenting book, Don't Feed the Dragon. It's also on YouTube, Sandy McDaniel, Sandy Spurgeon McDaniel, and it's Discipline One. There are five videos, well at this point there are five videos. There are videos with specific trainings. Discipline One is the penalty box. And on ParentingSOS.com, which is my website, boot camp, you can go and there are 15 videos on specific things. That one has an entry fee of $20, but then you, once you go in, you can watch all of them and just spend hours and hours and hours <laughs> learning from me. But the short way is to go to YouTube and take find the discipline one. It's about the penalty box, the minute drill. H3 and up for minding, for timeout, or for, 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 for minding, for losing your temper, uh, and for doing something in a reasonable amount of time. When you say to a child, do it now, they become burros, little donkeys, and they just plant their little feet. When you give them a chance to do something, to change their mind, then you have a much better chance that that will happen. How it works is, let's say the child's outside and you want the child to come inside. So you ask them to come in, they ignore you. So rather than screaming and yelling and entertaining the neighbors by screaming and yelling, you say, you're on the minute drill. You have one minute to be standing next to me. You want them to, if they're way out, they're, they, they need to be headed towards you. If they're close enough, they need to be standing next to you. It starts now. So the child comes, dutifully comes, but then gets about up to you and then starts the really slow walking, you know. The really slow walking. I mean, it's really slow walking. Okay. And it's like, I don't care. I'm not going to go. I might do this. Look out. But if they're not where I ask them to be, then I do this because I'm outside. Finger means that a penny is going to go into a jar with their name on it. What the penny means is any time during the day, randomly, you're going to take 15 minutes off of something fun that they thought they were going to do. TV time, go to the swimming pool, oh, you have a penny in the jar, you need to sit down for 15 minutes. Oh, you can, yeah, your friends came and you can go out and play. Oh, you have a penny in the jar. You can sit on the front porch for 15 minutes. Two or three day training. Once they hate the pennies, it's over. Once they really don't want a penny. Now, why would they care about 15 minutes off of something? I don't know. <laughs> but it works. <laughs> they hate it. And it'll be, this is what they do, you'll say, you're on the minute drill. <laughs> well, think of it this way. There was a little girl, she was three. We'd gone in the car, and she had done something with, that annoyed her mother. She got a pen. So she was screaming bloody murder in the car. Her mom said, keep that going, it'll cost you another penny. God, it's cute. Oh, beyond cute. The little three-year-old gets out of the car, plasters herself with the car, and says, I'm not going with you guys. Her mother looked at her and she said, honey, you're on the minute drill. She went, 
because she didn't want the penny she has. She does want another one. So what are her options? She has none. She came. When she went in, because she still had the one, she went crisscross applesauce and we jumped in the pool in 15 minutes, her mom said, come. Life interrupted. It drives them crazy. It bugs the snot out of them. They hate the pennies, but they don't resent them. Doesn't set off the anger, resentment, revenge cycle. I'll do one more, one more of the three. Meltdown. When a kid melts down, and they usually pick like the middle of the market or someplace to do it, <laughs> melts down. If you give them a minute, the minute drill, um, in a minute they can get pretty revved up. They can get really going, and then they can't back it out. So what we did was cut it down. I'm going to use you again. Leslie, it's okay to feel angry. It's not okay to melt down. I'm going to count backwards from five. That means five, four, three, two, one. When my hand gets closed, if you're still in melting down, whatever you call it to them, if you're still yelling and screaming, whatever it is, then it's going to cost you a penny. Then we'll go on the minute drill. For each minute you want to keep it going, it'll cost you a penny. I had a... Um, Asperger's kid, syndrome kid, and he would just, oh, oh my goodness. And, but he just hated the pennies. So he learned to, to cut it off, and then what we did is he would go and throw tennis balls off the garage to get that out, okay? So that worked for him. Uh, doing something in a reasonable time is pretty simple. You get, tell a child you want them to go and clean their room, you tell them exactly what it is. You give them 40 minutes to do it or 45 minutes to do it. You put a timer on. You say, in 45 minutes, I'm going to come and these are the four things you need to do. If you haven't done them, I will stand in the doorway and coach you. No problem. Well, kind of a problem. Because for each minute I need to coach you to do what you could have done without me, it's going to cost you a penny. We designed this for teenagers and it's just awesome because it gets them to get. The complete, complete training on, don't, on um, the minute drill, you can go to Don't Feed the Dragon, my book. It's all a thousand examples. It's written to help you as much as possible. Also, you can go to ParentingSOS.com and to boot camp, and there are 15 videos, one of which is about the minute drill. And it's me doing a complete training. Parenting is an easy job. There are some days when you just go, what was I thinking? What was that website? Sorry, website. ParentingSOS.com. What was I thinking? And you're the architect of a human being's life. I mean, <laughs> it's such an extraordinary job. And you know, I, I can't tell you how much I've worried over the years about doing a good enough job. And I might even have t taken on teaching parenting so I could learn enough to, to, to try to help and at least help my grandchildren, you know, I mean, whatever. But it's, a, it's an incredible responsibility. If you love your children, and if you're doing your best, and you're really trying, I remember saying to, to my daughter once, I said, you know, I, I, I could do this so much better than I'm doing it, and I'm sorry I'm making so many mistakes. But I'm trying to figure out how to be a good parent. And she said, it, it's okay, Mom. We know how much you care. And I did. I, I can't tell you how much I cared, and still do, you know. So every day, you do what you can do. I've provided as much information as I can for you to help you with all the things that you have to do and have to decide to do. But then you need to choose to use them. 
I commend you for being here tonight because there's thousands of things you could have done instead of being here. But it's so important to me to try to help you. But it's also so you care enough to come. I will tell you this, one day at a time, you get to do a lot of things over. Do your best. And the other thing is, if you need help, I'm here. You can find me really easily. And I live to help you parent your children well. All right? So, God bless. Thank you.